Across the globe and in the nooks and crannies of the world lie communities that inhabit some of the most bizarre and extraordinary places imaginable. From underground cities carved out of rock to floating islands made out of reeds, these unique homes showcase the remarkable adaptability some people have. Join me for the top 15 weirdest places where people actually live. Starting with number 15, Comoros. Comoros is an archipelago nation in southeastern Africa. It sits at the northern tip of the Mozambique Channel in the Indian Ocean. Moroni, the largest city, serves as both the capital and the heartbeat of the country. Since declaring independence from France on July 6, 1975, the Comoros has been navigating its unique position as the sole Arab League member in the Southern Hemisphere. As part of the African Union, the Comoros boasts a diverse cultural landscape with three official languages, Shikomori, French, and Arabic. Now, despite being the third smallest African country by area at 1,659 square kilometers, Comoros faces challenges driven by its high population density. In the most densely populated agricultural zones, numbers can reach up to a thousand people per square kilometer, posing potential environmental threats, especially considering the country's primarily rural and agricultural economy. But here's the kicker. With approximately 850,000 people, the Comoro stands as one of the world's least populated countries, yet its population density is significant averaging 275 individuals per square kilometer. Rapid population growth, particularly among the youth, creates a demographic complexity, with almost half of the population under the age of 15. Urbanization is on the rise, with major centers like Moroni, Mitsumiya Uli, and Mustanmudu shaping the country's landscape. Now, interestingly, a considerable Comorian diaspora, numbering between 200,000 and 350,000 individuals, has found a home in France, underscoring the global reach of this small yet distinct nation. Number 14. The Pitcairn Islands so the Pitcairn Islands, a remote group of volcanic islands in the southern Pacific Ocean, constitute the exclusive British overseas territory in that region. Consisting of four islands, Pitcairn, Henderson, Ducey, and Oino, these scattered land masses cover around 46 square kilometers in total. That's not much. Despite Henderson Island dominating the land area at 86% of it, only Pitcairn Island is inhabited. The closest neighbors are an island in French Polynesia, located 688 kilometers to the west, and Easter Island, situated about 2,000 kilometers to the east. The Pitcairn Islanders, a biracial ethnic group, trace their ancestry primarily to nine bounty mutineers and a few Tahitian consorts, evident in many islanders' surnames. The infamous Bounty Mutiny and its aftermath have captured attention in various books and film. As of January 2020, the territory had a mere 47 permanent residents, marking a significant population decline since 1940. Recognizing the importance of long-term sustainability, the island community acknowledges that repopulation is its primary strategic development objective. In an effort to address the demographic challenge, the government is actively working to attract migrants to the island. The impact of the population decline is evident, with only two births on Pitcairn in the last two decades leading up to 2012. Nevertheless, some Pitcairn mothers sought increased health care safeguards by traveling to New Zealand for pregnancy and childbirth. In a historic milestone in 2005, Shirley and Simon Young became the first married outsider couple to secure citizenship on Pitcairn. As of April 2021, the resident population remains at 47, though it's uncommon for all residents to be on the island simultaneously due to various reasons such as family visits, medical needs, or attendance at international conferences. Number 13, Bahrain. Bahrain, officially the Kingdom of Bahrain, stands as an island nation in West Asia, gracefully positioned on the Persian Gulf. Comprised of a small archipelago of 50 natural islands and an additional 33 artificial islands, Bahrain's geographical centerpiece is Bahrain Island, accounting for approximately 83% of the country's land mass. The kingdom is situated between Qatar and the northeastern coast of Saudi Arabia, linked by the King Fahd Causeway. Now, as of May 14, 2023, Bahrain's population stands at 1.5 million, with 712,000 being Bahraini nationals, as per the latest United Nations data. Covering a land area of just 750 square kilometers, Bahrain ranks as the third smallest nation in Asia, following the Maldives and Singapore. Manama serves both as the capital and the largest city. Over the years, Bahrain has experienced notable population growth, reaching 1.2 million in 2010 with a diverse demographic composition. While a majority identify as Middle Eastern, a substantial South Asian community, particularly from Kerala in India, has found home in the country. With a population density of 1,646 people per square kilometer in 2010, Bahrain is the fourth most densely populated sovereign state globally. 
Concentration is notably higher in the north, forming a quasi-metropolitan area, while the southern governorate remains less densely populated. Bahrain relies heavily on food imports to sustain its growing population, with significant dependencies on meat imports from Australia and sourcing 75% of its total fruit consumption needs from international markets. These ongoing efforts aim to strengthen Bahrain's economic resilience and cultural appeal in the face of regional competition. Number 12. Nauru Nauru, officially the Republic of Nauru, stands as a distinctive island country and microstate in Micronesia, nestled in the Central Pacific and part of Oceania. With Banaba of Kiribati as the nearest neighbor, approximately 300 kilometers to the east, Nauru is strategically located northwest of Tuvalu, about 1,300 kilometers northeast of the Solomon Islands, east-northeast of Papua New Guinea, and southeast of the Federated States of Micronesia, and directly south of the Marshall Islands. Spanning a mere 20 square kilometers, Nauru ranks as the third smallest country globally, surpassed only by Vatican City and Monaco. Despite its diminutive size, Nauru supports a population of about 10,800, making it the world's third smallest by population, larger only than Vatican City and Tuvalu. Inhabited since about 1000 BCE by people from Micronesia, Nauru underwent a colonial history, annexed by the German Empire in the late 19th century and later becoming a League of Nations mandated administered by Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. During World War II, the island was occupied by Japanese forces before gaining independence in 1968. The demographic landscape of Nauru scrutinized through national census reveals a population of 11,680 as of October 2021, with a density of 1,430 inhabitants per square mile. The overall life expectancy here is about 63.9 years, and the population dynamics witnessed steady growth until 2006 when the repatriation of thousands of Tuvaluan and Ir Kiribati workers prompted a shift. Since 1992, Nauru has maintained a positive natural growth rate, the birth rate surpassing the death rate. The age structure is most notably dominated by the 15 to 59 year old segment, constituting 57% of the population. The median age stands at 21.6, and the estimated gender ratios reflects 101 males per 100 females. The unique juxtaposition of a small landmass with a relatively high population density characterizes Nauru's demographic profile. Number 11. Supai Village. Supai, also known as Havasu and Havasupai, stand as a census-designated place within the Grand Canyon in Coconino County, Arizona in the United States. This unique settlement, as of the 2010 census, had a population of 208 residents. The area is characterized by its exceptional remoteness and can only be accessed by helicopter, on foot, or by mule. Situated 12 kilometers away from the nearest road, Supai holds the distinction of being the most remote community in the contiguous United States, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Mail delivery in Supai is particularly distinctive, as it's the sole place in the United States where mail is transported in and out exclusively by mules. Perishable goods dating back to 1989 are stored in a refrigerator in Peach Springs, Arizona, before being loaded onto mules for transport. Supai did face a significant flood in 1910 that impacted the town. In the 1960s, Martin Goodfriend, a tourist advocate for the Supai people, countering the perception of Supai as a mythical Shangri-La, a columnist for the Arizona Republic, Don Dadera, shed light on Goodfriend's efforts through articles. The community experienced evacuation in August of 2008 due to flooding of Havasu Creek and the failure of the Redlands Dam after heavy rainfall. Evacuees were transported to Peach Springs, Arizona, and subsequent flood events in 2010 and 2018 caused severe damage to trails, bridges, and campgrounds. Flash flooding in July of 2018 resulted in the helicopter evacuation of 200 visitors. Tourism was suspended from March 2020 to February of 2023 due to COVID-19 pandemic. To access Supai, one has to embark on an eight-mile hike, descending over 2,000 feet in elevation from Hualapai Hilltop through the picturesque Hualapai Canyon. This challenging journey offers a direct and immersive experience of the surrounding landscape. Number 10. Thamestown So, Thamestown, nestled approximately 30 kilometers from central Shanghai in the Shenzhen district, is a peculiar destination. This new town, named after the River Thames in London, United Kingdom, is a whimsical attempt at replicating British market town styles. Cobbled streets, Victorian terraces, corner shops, and iconic red telephone boxes transport visitors to an unusual fusion of English charm in the heart of China. Commissioned as part of the One City, Nine Towns Initiative in 2001, Thamestown was designed by the architectural firm Atkins and completed in 2006. It spans an area of less than half a square mile with the intention of accommodating over 10,000 residents. 
However, the reality turned out quite differently. High house prices deterred permanent residents, leading to an unexpected consequence. Thamestown became known as a ghost town. While the houses sold swiftly, most buyers were relatively affluent, acquiring properties as investments or second homes. The town's architectural mimicry extends to direct copies of English buildings, including a church modeled after Christ Church in Bristol, a pub, fish, a chip shop, and even Chester High Cross, replicating structures found in Dorset. The construction cost amounted to about 5 billion won. Thamestown's character is one of low density, single family housing with limited commercial and community facilities. It's a unique blend of British aesthetics viewed through a unique lens that's been described as a grotesque and extremely funny parody of an old English town by Jonathan Glancy. Well, despite that emptiness and the term virtual ghost town used by Business Insider, Thamestown continues to attract attention as a backdrop for wedding photography. The juxtaposition of its replicated English charm against its deserted reality renders Thamestown an oddity, offering a surreal experience for those who venture into this unconventional urban environment. Number 9. Longyearbyen, Svalbard Longyearbyen, dubbed the Longyear Town, holds the unique distinction of being the world's northernmost settlement with a population exceeding a thousand people. It's situated on the left bank of the Longyear Valley and along the shores of the Adventfjorden. The town is nestled in Svalbard, Norway, making the largest inhabited area of this archipelago. Longyearbyen stretches along the picturesque estuary leading into Isfjorden on the west coast of Spitsbergen, the broadest inlet on the island. Originally, it was named Longyear City until 1926. This remote settlement owes its existence to American John Monroe Longyear, who founded it in 1906. His Arctic Coal Company initiated coal mining operations, marking the town's genesis. And later in 1916, Storonorsk Spitsbergen Kulkompani assumed control of mining activities, a role it still plays today. Longyear Bien faced significant challenges during World War II, when the German Kriegsmarine nearly obliterated the town in 1943. However, resilient efforts led to post-war reconstruction. Now, historically, it was a company town. Longyearbyen experienced a shift in the 1990s, as most mining operations relocated to Svegruva. By 2017, SNSK ceased coal productions due to substantial financial losses incurred in 2014, prompted by adverse market conditions. Home to institutions like the University Center in Svalbard, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, and Svalbard Satellite Station, Longyearbyen became a hub for scientific exploration. Practical measures in this remote town include unique laws seldom seen elsewhere. Regulations include a ban on cats, restrictions on monthly alcohol purchases, and a mandate for individuals venturing outside to carry a rifle for polar bear protection. An intriguing anecdote surrounds the claim that it is quote-unquote illegal to die in Long Year Bin. While not strictly true, the town faces a peculiar situation stemming from a 1950 decision. Bodies buried in the permafrost during the 1918 flu pandemic, discovered remarkably preserved, sparked concerns about live strains of the virus. Consequently, residents deemed terminally ill are often required to relocate to the mainland due to the ban on local burials. This distinctive aspect of Longyearbyen blending historical influences, economic transitions, and the challenges of its extreme environment does make it a captivating and peculiar destination in the far reaches of the Arctic. Number 8. Wittenoom, Australia Wittenoom, an only recently abandoned town located about 1,400 kilometers north-northeast of Perth in the Pilbara region of Western Australia, stands as a haunting testament to the devastating consequences of asbestos mining. The town was established in the 1940s as a company town for blue asbestos mining, which became a lucrative industry in the mid-20th. Whitnoom's rise to prominence came during the 1950s, when it became Pilbara's largest town, with a peak population of 881 residents recorded in the 1961 census. The town supplied Australia's only source of blue asbestos during this period, however, its prosperity was short-lived, as health concerns surrounding asbestos mining grew, leading to the closure of the mine in 1966. By the early 2000s, the town had become declared a contaminated site, comprising 50,000 hectares and earning the dubious distinction of being the largest contaminated site in the Southern Hemisphere. The town's official status was revoked by the government of Western Australia in December of 2006, leading to the removal of its name from maps and road signs. The process of de-gazetting the town site was officially completed in 2007. The Whitnoom Steering Committee convened in April 2013 to finalize the closure of the town, restrict access to the area, and raise awareness of the risks associated with asbestos exposure. As of 2016, Whitnoom defiantly hosted three permanent residents who resisted the government's plans to remove services and demolish the town. 
However, by September 2022, the last remaining resident was evicted, marking the end of habitation in this hazardous location. A report in November of 2006 by consultants highlighted the extreme danger posed by asbestos contamination in Wittenum and the surrounding areas. The risks were categorized as medium for visitors and extreme for residents. In response to these findings, the Western Australian government commenced the demolition of the remaining structures in May of 2023, sealing the fate of Wittenum as a cautionary tale of the devastating consequences of an unchecked industrial practice. Number 7. Shibam, Yemen Nestled in Yemen, Shibam Hadramat emerges as a town of unparalleled architectural wonder, distinguished by its mudbrick-made high-rise buildings that have earned it the captivating title of the Manhattan of the Desert. Housing approximately 7,000 residents, Shibam serves as the hub of the district of Shibam within the governorate of Hadramat. This ancient town has a hot desert climate, where June, with an average temperature of 82 degrees Fahrenheit, stands as the hottest month, while January is the coldest, with temperatures averaging 65 degrees. Shibam's distinct architecture, primarily constructed from mud brick, has garnered it recognition as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The houses of Shibam, numbering around 500 tower blocks, rise impressively between 5 to 11 stories high, with each floor housing one or two rooms. It's often hailed as the oldest skyscraper city in the world. Shibam stands as an exceptional example of urban planning based on vertical construction principles. The city has some of the tallest mud buildings globally, with structures reaching heights exceeding 100 feet, akin to early high-rise apartment buildings. Encircled by a protective, fortified wall, Shibam is aptly known as the Walled City of Shibam, adding another layer to its mystique. However, the architectural wonders of Shibam face ongoing threats from wind, rain, and heat erosion, necessitating constant upkeep to preserve the integrity of these mud brick buildings. The town did experience significant changes in 2008 when flooding from a tropical storm compromised the foundations of many structures, leading to their collapse. But despite those challenges, Shibam remains an enduring testament to human ingenuity and resilience, capturing the imagination of all who encounter its ancient skyline. Number 6. The Floating Village of Ganve, Benin In the annals of colonial Brazil, a unique narrative unfolded as runaway slaves and free natives sought refuge deep within the Amazon to escape the harsh grip of Portuguese slavery. Amidst dense vegetation, intricate waterways, and the perils of wildlife and disease, these communities found solace, well hidden from the relentless pursuit of slave traders. Meanwhile, in a different corner of the world near Benin, a small group of people crafted a remarkable haven against Portuguese capture. The powerful West African Fon tribe engaged in hunting and selling other native tribes to the Portuguese, inadvertently playing a role in the genesis of Ganvi village. Located on Lake Nokue, Genve is a stilted village housing around 20,000 people. Its origins trace back to the ancestors who sought refuge on the water to elude the Fon warriors. Over the span of approximately 500 years, Ganvi has cultivated a rich and thriving culture, adapting to the challenges and opportunities presented by life on a lake. The distinctive feature of Ganvi is the unique architecture, with only a school standing on solid ground among its 3,000 buildings. Even a cemetery mound under construction will exist on water. The villagers navigate their aquatic world almost exclusively by boat. Domesticated land animals are a rarity here, confined to patches of grass emerging from the water. In the absence of traditional livestock, it relies on an intricate network of underwater fencing to corral and cultivate various fish populations, showcasing the village's resourcefulness. Located several kilometers from the nearest shoreline, Ganvi is a four-hour boat journey from the capital, making it Africa's largest lake village. The legacy of Ganvi is a testament to the resilience and ingenuity of a community that turned adversity into an opportunity to thrive amidst the serene waters of the lake. Number 5. Slab City, California Slab City, aptly nicknamed the last free place on Earth, stands as an eccentric anomaly in the Californian desert near Nyland. What was once a World War II marine barracks, Camp Dunlop, is now an alternative living community situated adjacent to an active bombing range. The camp earned its moniker from the persistent concrete slabs that lingered on the grounds long after the military base succumbed to bulldozers and abandonment. During the winter months, the desolate landscape of Slab City undergoes a transformation as thousands of campers, predominantly elderly retirees known as snowbirds, migrate to the area to escape the chill and revel in the warm desert climate, all without the encumbrance of fees. These temporary residents populate this vast expanse, residing in a motley array of shelters. While many arrive in RVs, some opt for more unconventional dwellings, repurposed abandoned structures like defunct buses or improvised driftwood shacks. 
In contrast, a handful of intrepid souls, colloquially dubbed slabbers, choose to endure the searing summer heat, with temperatures soaring above 120 degrees Fahrenheit. For the permanent residents of Slab City, economic constraints, often tethered to reliance on government assistance, draw them to this off-grid haven in the desert, living with limited access to amenities such as electricity, fresh water, and sewage treatment. The residents have adapted by harnessing solar power and creating rudimentary waste management systems. A communal shower fed by a nearby hot spring stands as an example to their resourcefulness. Now, beyond the challenges of survival, the lack of formal governance and regulation is a magnetic force for those seeking a life unbridled by societal constraints. In this self-governed enclave touted as counterculture heaven, a slab city boasts its own library, golf course, sculpture garden, live music stages, and a multitude of social clubs. Within the expansive grounds, diverse neighborhoods have emerged, each with its own set of rules and unique cultural identity. One such neighborhood is East Jesus, situated on the northern fringe of Slab City. Here, an open-air art museum welcomes visitors, showcasing an eclectic array of installations. The museum features a wall constructed from antiquated television sets, a house seemingly sinking into the earth, and a collectively built archway at its entrance. The space serves not only as an artistic canvas, but also as a communal living area surrounded by trailers inhabited by residents. Among notable figures associated with Slab City is Leonard Knight, the creator of the iconic Salvation Mountain that graces the entrance to this unconventional community. For over two decades, Knight, residing out of his truck, dedicated himself to crafting the vibrant art mountain. His departure, prompted by failing health, did not diminish his local legend status. Leonard Knight, even in his absence, continues to be revered as one of the most free-spirited, if not hippy-dippy, places in the country. Number 4. Tiandu Chang Tiandu Chang, located in the Hangzhou district off the east coast of China, stands as a fascinating experiment in real estate development offering a glimpse into a peculiar blend of European charm and Chinese ingenuity. Conceived around 2007, this Paris-themed gated community was designed to accommodate about 10,000 residents, replicating the allure of the French capital. However, the reality deviated significantly, and Tian Du Cheng is now home to only a fraction of its intended population, a modest 2,000 inhabitants. The main challenge to its allure is its geographical placement, positioned 40 minutes away from Hangzhou's bustling downtown and surrounded by farmlands. The allure of a Parisian experience seems to have fallen short of expectations, resulting in a community that evokes an eerie atmosphere rather than a romantic vibrancy. To enhance the illusion of a European escape, Tian Du Cheng boasts a series of architectural replicas, including a towering 300-foot Eiffel Tower, a rendition of Champs Elysees adorned with imitation Parisian restaurants, a chapel of love catering to couples seeking faux luxurious photo opportunities, and a chateau perched on a hill. The surreal experience continues as visitors explore the Champs Elysees, encountering an unsettling absence of foot traffic. This place appears frozen in time, with stone busts of poets repurposed for practical use serving as places to hang laundry. The imitation storefronts with misspelled cursive writing and fading paint contribute to the overall sense of abandonment. Intricate statues of horses stand juxtaposed with women selling cotton candy and adding to the surreal atmosphere of what can only be described as a bizarro Paris, a hauntingly empty replica of the city of love. In the end, Tian Du Cheng presents a funky little paradox, a place where you can be physically present, yet the emptiness and haunting ambiance might leave you feeling as if you're in two places at once, experiencing a distorted version of the romanticized Parisian dream. Number 3. Rukan, Norway In the serene town of Rukan, nestled between towering mountains, a unique solution has illuminated its dark winters, creating a spotlight of sunlight in the small town square. For half of the year, Rukan is ensconced in shadows, with sunlight unable to pierce the imposing mountains surrounding it. However, the ingenious intervention of three colossal mountaintop mirrors, known as the Scholzpilet, or Sun Mirror, has transformed the town's daylight experience. Conceived by artist Martin Anderson, who himself felt the impact of Rukan's sun-deprived months after moving there in 2002, the Sun Mirror became a reality in 2013. These mirrors, situated 1,476 feet above the town, are a computer-controlled array that adjusts every 10 seconds, ensuring a constant beam of sunlight is directed onto Rukan's central square. During the six months when the sunlight struggles to reach the town, the sun mirrors create a striking pool of light covering around 600 square meters. The semicircle of wooden benches in this spotlight-like circle provides a unique and inviting space for residents and visitors to bask in the sunlight. 
The idea of harnessing sunlight for this place is not entirely new. A century earlier, Sam Ida, the town's founder and industrial leader, had a similar aspiration. However, lacking the technological means at the time, he instead built a Krosobanen, an aerial tramway ferrying residents up to the mountains to experience the sunlight. Initially met with skepticism by some residents who questioned 5 million nok, which is about 778,000 US dollars, the mirror soon became a symbol of Rukan's uniqueness. The town's international recognition, fueled by a novel concept, contributed to a surge in tourism. Visitors from around the world now come here to witness and experience standing in the radiant light created by the sun mirrors. This innovative solution not only brightens its winters, but it also showcases the transformative power of creativity and technology in enhancing the quality of life for its residents. The sun mirrors have become an emblematic feature, drawing attention to Rukan's distinct charm and fostering a sense of pride among its inhabitants. Number 2. The Kowloon Walled City the Kowloon Walled City, also known as the City of Darkness, stood as an anomaly within the urban landscape, a dense and chaotic conglomerate of towering buildings, narrow alleyways, and a labyrinthine network of pathways. It earned the title of the most densely populated city on Earth, hosting an astounding number of addresses within its confined space. The city was a unique blend of architecture and a kind of organism, with a staggering population of over 33,000 residents squeezed into a hundredth of a square mile. Those tower blocks, ranging from 10 to 14 stories high, crowded the limited space, forming a chaotic yet interconnected structure. The absence of uniformity in shape, height, and building materials contributed to the surreal nature of the walled city. Cast iron balconies jutted against brick annexes, and a web of wiring and cables covered every available surface. The city's landscape was a dizzying collage of architectural improvisation a result of spontaneous construction over the years. Entering the Kowloon Walled City was akin to stepping into perpetual darkness. The narrow alleyways, hundreds in numbers, wound through the complex-like capillaries, some passing below buildings while others formed tunnels of refuse from discarded materials. Thousands of leaky and corroded water pipes adorned the walls and ceilings, adding to that chaotic visual tapestry. On March 10, 1987, following the decision to convert the walled city into a park, the Secretary for District Administration formally requested the Urban Council to oversee the site post-demolition. Despite reservations from the Urban Services Department about the necessity of yet another park in the area, the Council agreed to accept the government's proposal. Compensation became a critical aspect of the transition, with the government allocating around 350 million US dollars to approximately 33,000 people and businesses. This compensation plan was formulated by a special committee of the Hong Kong Housing Authority. However, not all residents were content with the compensation offered, leading to forced evictions between November 1991 and July of 92. The planning for the demolition commenced on March 23, 1993 and concluded in April 1994. Number 1. Miyakejima in the remote reaches of Japan's Izu Islands lies Miyakejima, a place where the natural elements take center stage in a unique and at times hazardous performance. Perched atop an active volcanic chain that has erupted six times in the last century, Miyakejima isn't just grappling with the threat of volcanic eruptions, it contends with the highest concentrations of poisonous gases, primarily sulfur, constantly wafting up through the earth. This island, characterized by a composite cone formed in the late Pleistocene period, carries an intriguing geological history. With a circular coastline spanning 88 kilometers and an average diameter of about 8 kilometers, its towering peak, Mount Oyama, stands as the island's crown, reaching a height of 759 meters. Over the past 890 years, this active volcano has erupted 13 times, etching its presence into the historical records as far back as the Nara period. In the summer of 2000, Mount Oyama unleashed another series of eruptions, leading to the complete evacuation of Miyakejima by September. Although the need for masks has since diminished, alarms serve as vigilant sentinels, echoing warnings if toxic gas levels surge. Continuous monitoring, facilitated by a multi-component gas analyzing system, enhances the prediction of volcanic activity by detecting it pre-eruptive degassing or rising magma. Now, amidst this surreal, almost post-apocalyptic landscape, Miyakejima remains open to intrepid tourists. Beyond the ominous veil of poison gas, pockets of lush beauty adorn the island, creating a striking contrast. For those who dare to embrace the juxtaposition of danger and allure, gas masks await at various tourist shops upon arrival. Flights connecting Miyakejima Airport and Haneda Airport offer a relatively quick journey, spanning about 50 minutes, providing a glimpse into the island's unique character. 
Yet, the island's accessibility comes with a caveat. The volatile nature of the region, characterized by a high volume of sulfuric gas, has left its mark on transportation. Following the eruption of Matoyama on July 14, 2000, a relentless flow of toxic gases rendered the air unsafe for travel. Consequently, flights were abruptly suspended, leaving the airspace above Meakejima vacant for nearly eight years. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'll see you next time. Thank you to our channel members.